So is it cool to sit in the front of the thing? Like, like, uh, like Matt Lee does? Or is it like, Sorry, what? Is that coming? Like, Fine. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just wondering if it's cool or beneficial to sit in the front. <laughs> well, I mean, I have been told repeatedly, and now this is going on 19 months, that we're going to sit in the front row. Oh, really? Yes. So, well, I'm. That works for one everybody. I know, exactly. Oh, so by your, by your, by Royce. No, like, usually, no, these people know, are like, I was, oh, really? Like you said, I'm like, like committing a, that's what I was wondering. You might have been. If I was committing a horrible you football. You might be, I don't know. I'm, yeah, I'm going to stay out of it. But we have got a good service at the church. So we have, we have a wire service as well. The wires are on the floor. Yeah, the wires are on the floor. Yeah. I'm jealous of the wire service. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. I'm like, there's a person. Now, there's a But the wives get to come every day, so where the the primary newspaper yeah. alternates. So it seems like the, the newspaper should be cool to front now. If the wives get to come every day. Do you want another email saying on that as well? Yeah. <laughs> that sets a lot of bugs. I'm gonna send it right now. No, I'm gonna send it late tonight. <laughs>
Oh, yeah. Watch out. That's the ACSB. Oh, <laughs> you want to get a label for next time to help those people out? Yeah, I know. So, if you're ever in my seat, do you want me to announce it publicly in front of everybody or do you want me to just quietly? I'm not trying to be a dickhead. Good afternoon. We have a few uh, elements at the top, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first, as you all know, uh, the department yesterday lost a giant. We all know that Secretary Schultz was a foreign policy visionary who helped herald the peaceful end of the Cold War 
and whose legacy left us safer from the specter of the world's most dangerous weapons. What may be less well known, however, are the profound ways in which he shaped this institution. He was a champion of the women and men of the department, and it's no accident that our Foreign Service Institute bears his name. As the Secretary said yesterday, the work we do now and will do well into the future will be shaped by Secretary Schultz's legacy. We send our deepest condolences to Secretary Schultz's family and loved ones. Turning to India, uh, where a burst glacier yesterday resulted in landslides and floods, our thoughts are with the, our Indian friends and partners during this challenging time. We extend our deepest condolences to the family and friends of the deceased, and we hope for a successful rescue effort and a speedy and full recovery for the, inj for the injured. Moving on to the U.S. decision to re-engage with the Human Rights Council, which was formally announced this morning. This morning, the Secretary announced the immediate U.S. re-engagement with the U.N. Human Rights Council. That process is already underway in Geneva, where the U.S. mission today participated in a regular organizational uh, meeting of the Council. For now, that engagement will be as an observer, which will allow us to speak in the Council, participate in negotiations, and work with partners. As the Secretary noted in his statement, we recognize the Council's flaws, but we do believe that the best way to improve it is to work from within. When it performs as designed, the Council can be a powerful tool to promote fundamental freedoms, protect the rights of women, girls, LGBTQI plus individuals, and other marginalized communities, while promoting accountability for human rights violators around the world. Next, the United States congratulates the people of Ecuador for ex exercising their democratic right to vote for their leaders. We also congratulate the many officials, public servants, and volunteers whose dedication made the vote possible under the challenging conditions presented by the global COVID-19 pandemic. While we await the final results of the first round vote from the National Electoral Council that will determine the second place finisher, we urge people to remain calm and to exercise patience while Ecuador's institutions finish tallying the votes and work to resolve conflicts in a peaceful and transparent manner in accordance with Ecuador's constitution and established norms and processes. Finally, Africa is a priority for the Biden administration. In a video message, President Biden extended greetings to African leaders and the African people as they ga gathered for the 34th annual AU Summit this past weekend. We are committed to engaging our African partners early and often in pursuing our shared interests and our shared values. We will reinvigorate and restore our relationships with the continent, building substantive reciprocal partnerships with African governments, institution, and people based on mutual interests and mutual respect. Uh, so with that, um, Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Eric. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Um, last night in the middle of the football game, although it wasn't a very good game, so I read it intently when it came in, uh, you put out a statement about uh, warning the Houthis uh, about uh, attacks against civilians. And um, I, I, I'm wondering if the fact that you felt the need to put out that statement gives you any pause about the decision that was made just two days ago, or three, well, two days ago then, three days ago now, Friday, um, to begin the process of delisting the Houthis uh, as a foreign terrorist organization. Um, and if it, it and if it doesn't give you any pause about that, what, what, why not? Well, Matt, we have been very clear, and we've been very clear about uh, two things. Um, in the first instance, we've been very clear, and you heard the secretary from this podium on his first uh, official day as Secretary of State, um, when asked about his priorities for reviewing uh, the policies of the previous administration, he raised, um, he, he, he actually offered um, this designation of Ansarallah um, as something he uh, prioritized uh, to move upon expeditiously, uh, given the profound humanitarian implications uh, of this designation. I think he cited at the time uh, that 80%, some 80% of Yemen's civilian population lives under Houthi control in Yemen, uh, which is why, of course, um, we're profoundly concerned um, for the humanitarian implications uh, of of that designation. And so that's why um, uh, we, in fact, did uh, move very quickly to review that policy. Uh, you may have heard um, from members of Congress who have been vocal about this, uh, that we notified the Hill of the Secretary's intent to revoke the foreign terrorist organization and sp specially designated global terrorist designations of Ansarallah. Um, we did that 
uh, late last week. We've also been very clear about a second element. Um, this intent to revoke that designation has nothing to do uh, with our view of the Houthis uh, and their reprehensible conduct, uh, including, as you mentioned, attacks against civilians and the kidnapping uh, of American citizens, uh, um, uh, among other moves. Um, we are committed, as we again said uh, last night, to helping Saudi Arabia uh, defend its territory against further such attacks. Um, uh, our planned action, the Secretary's intent to delist, um, is due, as I said before, to uh, the humanitarian consequences um, of this last minute designation. We can do two things at once. Uh, we can ensure that we do not add to the suffering of Yemeni civilians, Yemen now home to what is believed to be the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe, while um, continuing to stand um, with Saudi Arabia um, in the face of these attacks from the Houthis. Yeah, but aren't you, Bert, I mean, you say you can do two things at once, but by revoking this designation and the sanctions that it entails, um, aren't you helping the Houthis and at the same time uh, helping them attack in what you said in your own statement last mm -hmm. night, attack civilians, which makes the civilian crisis even worse, no? Uh, I, I would dispute that. I think we will certainly keep up the pressure on the leadership of the Ansarallah movement, of the Houthis. Um, uh, we can do that um, without the sort of broad designation, the two designations that I spoke to um, that do have uh, tremendous uh, pernicious impacts on the humanitarian right. implications just, of the last thing on this, on, when you, you, you kept saying intent to, mm -hmm. is there a, a chance that you might not go through with it? No, I referred to the intent because uh, in this matter and across the board, we intend to return to regular order, um, including regular regular order when it comes to our um, uh, interactions and consultations with Congress. Um, the secretary wanted to uh, make sure that uh, he had uh, apprised Congress uh, of this intent. As I mentioned before, um, we did that last week. Um, uh, and so it remains an intent as of now. Yes, Myra. Um, <clears throat> a quick follow up since we're on Yemen. Uh, the UN Yemen envoy met with Zarif today in Iran to discuss ending the conflict in Yemen. Does the United States believe Iran is still providing support to Houthis? And if so, what kind of support? After this, I'm going to move on to another topic. Uh, well, when it comes to our assessment of the specific support that Iran may be providing to the Houthis, um, I would refer you, uh, some of that may be um, predicated in, in uh, intelligence channels. I wouldn't want to go too far into that. What we have said generally uh, is that Iran has been a malign force in the region. Um, we have spoken of its support for proxies, for terrorist groups, um, its support for uh, the Houthis as well. I don't think we want to go, uh, or at least I don't want to go further today in uh, detailing that support, um, uh, but if we do have more to share, we will. Right. And on Myanmar, so uh, over the past couple of days, tens of thousands of people have been protesting and uh, against the military coup, and there's a fear that the army uh, will move on them. How close are you in finalizing your action in response to the military takeover and the fact that these demonstrations and the threat of the army moving towards them, does that add the sense of urgency? Well, we've always operated with a tremendous sense of urgency here. That is why uh, within hours uh, of the military's coup uh, in Burma, we called it as such. Um, I think more broadly, uh, when it comes to what we've seen in, in recent days and recent hours, um, it, is, it is fair to say that we stand uh, with the duly elected representatives of the people of Burma uh, in their efforts to speak uh, for the people of the country. Uh, we join them in demanding the immediate and full restoration of the democratically elected government. Uh, we stand with the people of Burma, support their right to assemble peacefully, including to protest peacefully uh, in support of the democratically elected government, uh, and the right to freedom of expression, including the freedom to seek, to receive, uh, to impart information both online uh, and offline. We're, of course, um, very concerned uh, about the military's recent announcement restricting uh, public gatherings. Um, as I said before, we strongly support the right of all individuals in Burma and, and around the world uh, to freedom of expression, association, peaceful assembly, uh, including for uh, the purposes of peaceful protest. Uh, when it comes to that review that you mentioned, um, we're of course taking a very close look um, at the uh, policy measures uh, that we could potentially enact um, should uh, the military not, not change its course. Um, we are moving uh, quickly uh, in that measure, and we're doing so, I think, consistent with the principle that I outlined with Matt in a very different context, making sure that whatever we do um, to hold the military to account uh, for this coup 
uh, that we don't add to um, the humanitarian uh, the humanitarian concern of the people of Burma. Uh, so we're we're doing that in this case as well. Can you come back to Yemen for this? Hi. Um, well, let's stick with Burma for just one moment, okay. and then I'll come right back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. Uh, no, the the junta chief in in Burma said that this time the military rule will be different, promising free and fair elections at the end of uh, the emergency period. Do you see that as, do you welcome this kind of statement or is it clearly a non-starter for, for you? It's a non-starter. Uh, we've been very clear where we stand. Uh, we stand with uh, the duly elected representatives of the people of Burma. Um, we stand with the people of Burma uh, who are now peacefully uh, taking to the streets um, to uh, exercise their universal rights. We stand with them. Yes, on Burma. Uh, Burma. Sure. Will. Uh, thanks. I uh, just wanted to ask to what uh, degree this came up in the call between Secretary Blinken and and Yang uh, of China. Was there any kind of effort to resolve the the um, situation in Burma, or was it the kind of thing as you know where there's just a disagreement about uh, you know whether there's a need to uh, for the military to step back? Well, uh, we did issue a readout uh, of that call. Um, this has been a staple of the secretary's calls um, with uh, his counterparts uh, since February 1st, since uh, the date of the coup. Uh, we have been um, encouraging China, uh, both privately uh, and in public, uh, to condemn uh, this action, to join the international community, uh, to join um, uh, the United States and, and those other countries, uh, a large swath of the world that has spoken out uh, in no uncertain terms uh, to condemn uh, this anti uh democratic uh, action. And to that end, um, I would um, point you to the statement that came out of the UN Security Council um, uh, uh, last week. Um, it did have um, some strong language. Of course, uh, China did not stand in the way of that, but we continue to believe that uh, the Chinese um, uh, need to uh, further condemn uh, what has taken place uh, in Burma in recent days. Have you or any U.S. officials been in touch with Aung San Suu Kyi or any of the detained NLD leaders or the military officials who are leading this junta? And then are you considering in the face of the curfews and the sh uh, crackdowns on protesters ordering departure of um, non-emergency diplomats from the post there? So uh, on your final question, um, the uh, we issued shortly after the events of February 1st, the coup on February 1st, uh, the U.S. Embassy, uh, the U.S. Mission in Burma, uh, issued uh, a message to American citizens there. They did full uh, accounting, full accountability uh, for uh, their personnel. Uh, I am not aware of any plans uh, for uh, a drawdown or an ordered uh, departure um, uh, at this time. But of course, those are uh, matters that we uh, continuously uh, evaluate. Um, Remind me of your previous question. Uh, have you been in touch with any uh, of the detained? So I'm going to speak for the Department of State. Um, I, I will say that shortly after the events of February 1st, um, we made an effort uh, to reach out to Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, we did that both uh, informally and we did that uh, formally as well. Uh, those requests, of course, were denied. Andrew. I think I wanted to ask about Iran. Was Raj, you had a Yemen question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, Yemen. it's okay. Um, I had a couple of more questions on Yemen. Yes. Uh, number one, yes, reversing the SGGT and the FTO designations, does that affect the Magnitsky Act sanctions on individual Houthi leaders? And then the UK government announced earlier today that it's going to continue selling weapons systems to the Saudis. And of course, we all know the controversy around the Saudi involvement in the Yemeni civil war. What is the U.S.'s take on uh, Downing Street's decision? Is the U.S. going to talk to the British about perhaps holding back on more weapon sales in order to promote the peace process? Uh, so on your uh, second question, uh, I think we'll let the British government uh, speak to their decisions when it comes to um, uh, their relationships with uh, the Saudi government or, or any other government. Obviously, uh, we have no closer partner, the special relationship um, uh, in the bilateral relationship uh, with, with London. Um, we uh, are consistently sharing notes, sharing views. Uh, I think they, they um, uh, and, and we have left no doubt um, more broadly um, where we stand uh, on this issue. And you heard uh, late last week following um, uh, the president's visit to the department uh, that we outlined uh, a, a, new a new approach, took steps to uh, end 
uh, the war in Yemen, a war that has, again, created a humanitarian catastrophe um, and a strategic catastrophe as well. Um, I'll run quickly um, uh, through those steps that we took. Um, first, we made very clear that we are going to be focused intensely um, on a, a diplomatic solution, working through the UN-led process uh, and channels to restore the long uh, dormant peace talks. Uh, we'll work closely with the UN envoy, Martin Griffiths, uh, and you heard the president himself uh, name uh, Tim Linderking as our uh, special envoy uh, to the conflict. Second, um, as we said last week as well, we're ending all American support for offensive operations uh, in Yemen, including uh, those relevant uh, arms sales. Um, as we said at the time, this does not apply to our operations uh, against AQAP, um, but it does include both materiel and restricting our intelligence sharing uh, relationships with Saudi Arabia uh, in the Saudi-led coalition uh, in accordance with um, the, the president's guidance. And then third, we also made clear, as I was um, mentioning to Matt, um, that we do understand in the midst of all of this, Saudi Arabia faces a gen genuine security threats from Yemen, which we again saw um, over uh, the weekend. Uh, and so as part of the interagency process and the interagency process that will um, uh, beyond this review um, future potential um, weapons transfers, we will look for ways to improve support um, for Saudi Arabia's ability uh, to defend itself uh, and its territory against threats. Thank you. Uh, Rich. Thanks, Dave. Um, as you uh, mentioned earlier, the administration has no interest in playing FTO whiplash here and returning um, the, the Houthis to that designation. But is there something that the administration is considering doing short of an FTO designation, any type of sanctions that the administration would um, to sort of go with the or else of your statement from yesterday? Well, I, I think, Rich, we've been very clear um, that the Houthis uh, are malign actors. Um, their, com their conduct as I said before, is reprehensible. Um, I, I, the way in which they have afflicted, the, the, the um, manner in which they have inflicted suffering um, on the people of Yemen, the people they uh, purport to govern, um, uh, their neighbors, um, the threat they pose to our interests um, in Yemen uh, several years back. Um, that is why uh, we, we can and will continue to keep up the pressure um, on the Ansarallah, on, on the Houthi leadership. Um, just as we take uh, these steps that uh, have received bipartisan, uh, strong bipartisan support um, to ensure that we are not uh, worsening the humanitarian suffering of the people of Yemen. We can do both things uh, at the same time. Andrea. Can I sure. Related, but <laughs> uh, well, first, thank you for your comments about Secretary Schultz. It means a lot to a lot of people here. Um, on Iran, the Ayatollah statement, followed up, of course, by Fareed's interview with mm -hmm. uh, Foreign Minister Zarif, seemed to shut down any possibility of uh, any progress until the U.S. lifts sanctions. Um, help us understand what wiggle room there is in that. I know you're not going to negotiate here, but... <laughs> well, you, uh, you saw my line. Um, I, am, I am not going to negotiate. Uh, you see that as, you know, a dead end. Uh, so we don't see this broader, uh, uh, this broader opportunity as a dead end at all. Um, the proposal, um, and you have heard it uh, for months now, um, from the uh, then candidate Biden and now President Biden has been very clear. Uh, if Iran is willing uh, to resume full compliance with the JCPOA, uh, we will um, reenter uh, that deal as well. Um, we will seek to lengthen uh, and strengthen um, uh, its provisions, including vis-a-vis uh, the nuclear provisions, using it as a platform uh, to um, then negotiate follow-on agreements um, that would uh, address Iran's other malign activities, some of which we've already uh, discussed uh, in this briefing. I think uh, rather than uh, negotiate here from the podium, what I will do is point to what we have been doing uh, really since uh, the early days of this administration, I suppose we still are in the early days of this administration, uh, when it comes to the coordination with our allies, with our partners, with members of Congress. Uh, we spoke, I believe it was on Friday, uh, about Secretary Blinken's uh, participation in a meeting with uh, the E3. Uh, Iran, of course, did feature into that. Um, we uh, offered a readout uh, of that interaction. The Secretary has, of course, been in touch with uh, bilaterally uh, with our European uh, allies. Uh, with other um, uh, with other counterparts um, who 
uh, were either part of the original P5 plus one, um, or uh, of course who do have um, uh, an interest uh, in this going forward. So those consultations, that coordination uh, is ongoing um, uh, as with uh, Congress as well. Uh, I think rather than uh, respond uh, to comments that may be emanating from Tehran, um, we're going to uh, do our own consultations, um, ensure that uh, we are synchronized, that we're harmonized uh, with our closest partners uh, and go from a position of strength from there. Yes. Are there other incentives that we can offer Iran such as not opposing IMF loans and other financial incentives that they could get, which would not technically be a lifting of sanctions. And is there any uh, effort to reach out bilaterally? Uh, so on your second question, uh, again, our focus has been um, on engaging uh, both in multilateral and bilateral fora with our partners uh, and allies. Um, uh, when it comes to um, any engagement with the Iranians, uh, we're, we're not there yet. Um, we want to, again, make sure that um, we have our ducks in a row um, with our closest friends, our closest uh, partners and allies, uh, as well as with uh, the institution of uh, the United States Congress. Um, when it comes to humanitarian gestures, the, the elements you mentioned, uh, I think that would probably fall in the category of negotiating from the podium. So I wouldn't want to, uh, I wouldn't want to go there. Um, uh, but again, um, we are going to uh, uh, make sure that uh, we are in uh, the same, on the same page uh, as our partners, our allies, um, that we have, um, uh, that we have uh, undertaken those consultations with Congress um, before uh, uh, we were we would um, uh, allude to any of those measures. Do you see the date of uh, February 21st when uh, Iran has said it will uh, stop following the additional protocol with the, the inspections uh, requirements? Uh, do you see that as a deadline for your full compliance or full compliance or some kind of red line that they shouldn't cross? No. Um, on February 21st, if Iran has not uh, resumed full compliance um, with the deal, Iran will still be out of compliance with the deal um, by, ne by definition. Um, uh, what we have put on the table is that uh, we are looking for Iran to resume its full compliance. Um, of course, as uh, you just alluded to with your question, Iran is quite a ways out of compliance uh, in a number uh, of, of specific areas. Um, uh, so we aren't looking to any particular date. Um, uh, we are looking for Iran to um, uh, uh, indicate its willingness um, to uh, uh, go along with the proposition that, um, as a candidate, um, uh, Vice President Biden put on the table and the proposition that remains on the table today. On Iran? On, on Iran? Uh, we'll, we'll let's move around a little bit. Yes. Thank you. Uh, also on Iran, how, how does this administration intend to deal with the hostage situation? Um, obviously, the, the Iranians are still holding including one American, uh, uh, Bakir Namazi, I mean, uh, Bava, sorry, uh, Siamak Namazi, who was picked up during the Obama administration. That's right. Um, uh, look, the secretary uh, was asked about this, I believe, uh, in one of his, um, uh, his first broadcast interview. Um, uh, and uh, he made very clear that um, we have no higher priority uh, than the safe return of Americans who are being held unjustly uh, around the world. Uh, of course, that uh, includes uh, in Iran. Um, uh, we are, um, uh, you know that we have a special envoy um, in this building. Uh, there is a hostage uh, recovery fusion cell um, that is uh, working elements of these cases as well. Um, we can do these things uh, in, in, in parallel. But do you have any sort of, have you launched any negotiations on this specifically? with um, Iran? Are you opening up channels to talk about that? So and are the, you working with partners because the Iranians are holding many other foreign nationals? So as you know, as well. the Swiss are our protecting power um, within, within Iran. Uh, we um, coordinate very closely with them. Uh, they represent um, those interests for us uh, when it comes to uh, American citizens who are being held uh, in Iran. I wouldn't want to uh, detail um, what may be going on behind closed doors. Um, but suffice to say, we have no higher priority uh, than the release of uh, American citizens who are uh, detained unjustly around the world, including uh, in Iran. Anything else on Iran before we move on? Um, we'll go here and then to Rosalind, yes. Okay, you just said um, you don't see this broader opportunity as a dead end. Is it because like the comments from the Supreme Leader like irreversible and final, do you see them as just posturing 
And then could the administration be considering something less for less, like you guys will give some economic relief, but not nothing too big in return for like around halting some of the violations? I, I wouldn't want to speculate as to what may undergird uh, comments from the Supreme Leader, comments from the Iranian president, uh, comments from others in the Iranian context, nor would I, again, want to negotiate from the podium. So um, we'll probably leave that there. Rosalind? Well, piggybacking on your comment that Iran is already out of compliance, there are reports that IAEA inspectors may have found evidence of radioactive material at two sites that the Iranians had blocked them from mm -hmm. searching last year. But after a negotiation, they apparently made it to these sites found evidence of possible nuclear weapons related activity. Is there any comment from this podium given that there hasn't been formal notification to member states of the IAEA? Well, on that, I would need to refer you to the IAEA. Um, I do think it is uh, a, a worthwhile reminder um, of the provisions of the 2015 Iran deal that we are attempting, um, that we would like to see Iran uh, resume full compliance with. Um, Iran, as I mentioned before, has distanced itself um, from that agreement in any uh, number of ways. The 2015 deal, uh, 2015 deal um, limits uh, enriched uranium stockpile. Uh, it uh, puts a cap on enrichment uh, levels at 3.67%. Uh, it uh, limits the, uh, the centrifuges um, that Iran is uh, allowed to have. It limits its R&D. Um, it limits its heavy water stockpile, um, uh, and I think most importantly, in, in an element that is often overlooked, um, Iran, under the uh, nuclear deal um, uh, and under the non-proliferation non treaty, uh, there is a permanent prohibition on Iran ever obtaining a, a nuclear weapon. Uh, and so that's why we think it is so important um, that as a starting point, uh, that Iran resume uh, that full compliance uh, with the nuclear deal. That's why it's been the predicate uh, of our uh, diplomatic path that we've put forward. Iran resumes that full compliance. Um, the United States will do the same. We'll then undertake uh, diplomacy to lengthen, strengthen uh, the, the uh, provisions and to use it again uh, as uh, not the ceiling, but the floor for follow on agreements to take on uh, other elements of uh, Iran's malign activity. Michelle. So I have a few topics. Uh, first, from Sudan, any comment on the formation of the new government there? I uh, will. We can get back to you on that. Um, uh, we'll take that question. Okay. And uh, second, on Lebanon, uh, political and religious leaders in Lebanon are calling for an international conference under the UN uh, auspices to protect the constitution and put an end to the multiplicity of arms. Uh, does the U.S. support such calls? And to what extent the uh, U.S. support uh, supports the French initiative in Lebanon? Well, um, you saw uh, last week it was that uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, together with his uh, French counterpart, um, uh, did put out a very strong um, uh, statement uh, of support um, for uh, the people of, of Lebanon. It was pegged to the six-month anniversary of the uh, deadly and, and horrific uh, blast in, in Beirut. So I would uh, refer you there. If we have any additional comment, we'll be able to provide that. And on the international conference, do you support? If we have any additional comment, we'll be able to so get back to you. Can I ask you to, I mean, do you accept, I mean, you just said in response to the last Iran question mm -hmm. that Iran has distanced itself from the deal in, in, in many ways. Uh, okay, fair enough. But you do accept that the United States actually walked away from the deal, pulled out, withdrew. Maybe not this administration, but you do accept that the United States pulled out of the deal, right? I, I think that's the reality. I wouldn't. I wouldn't dispute that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so but, you're, uh, you're. So you're. You know, when you when you. So you you're starting from a you know from a, a, a position behind the starting line here. You accept that or no? I uh, I think what I would accept is that uh, we have outlined consistently and clearly a path forward um, for. Uh, uh, diplomacy um, for Iran, um, uh, a path forward for diplomacy that you know we are intent to engage um, uh, closely with our allies and partners, members of Congress on. Um, I, you know I'm not going to um, stand here and um, I don't want to uh, speak um, for the previous administration. I'm speaking for this administration. I'm speaking for our path forward. Okay. Uh, secondly, on the uh, the UNHCR HRC uh, decision this morning. 
uh, taking note of that, also taking note of the fact that you guys have said that, yes, it's got problems mm -hmm. and we want to reform it. We want to do it from within. One of those problems the previous administration cited and pulling out mm -hmm. of it, withdrawing from it, uh, was an uh, anti-Israel mm -hmm. bias. And uh, I, I want to ask about that, but also your the Secretary's comments last week about the International Criminal Court and um, its uh, decision which you we talked about um, on the phone on Friday. Um, but if you are uh, sitting in Israel right now, why should you not think that these two positions, one, Palestine does not have a, is not a state party, is not a state, uh, and, it can, and it should not be allowed to bring um, a case before the ICC. And then the decision to, rejoin or to return to the um, right, Human Rights Council as an observer um, after you, what you accept as an anti-Israel bias, I, I, I believe. Um, I, you know, how, how, how do you square those? Uh, you know, if you're sitting in Israel, mm -hmm. uh, how, how, how should you take these two things? Well, um, I think this, uh, first of all, of course, we put out, uh, I think, a, what was a very strong statement um, in the aftermath of the ICC ruling. Um, that statement made clear, um, as we made clear when the Palestinians purported to join uh, the Rome Statute in 2015, um, that we don't believe um, the Palestinians qualify as a sovereign state uh, and therefore are not qualified to obtain membership as a state or to participate um, as a state in international organizations, entities, or conferences, uh, including uh, the ICC. We'll continue to uphold President Biden's strong commitment to Israel and its security, um, including opposing actions that seek to target Israel unfairly. That takes me uh, to the decision uh, we announced earlier today. And I think our orienting, orienting principle here uh, is that the United States can be a constructive force, that we can help shape um, the course of world events, we can help shape international institutions when we're present, uh, when we're at the table. Um, we believe that the United States um, plays a constructive role um, on the council um, uh, when we play a constructive role on, our, on the council in concert with our allies and partners, positive change is possible. It is within reach. Um, you outlined one of those uh, reforms that is necessary, the council's disproportionate focus on Israel. Um, uh, and second, um, I think ensuring countries um, that ensuring countries with strong human rights records uh, serve on uh, the council. Um, we uh, firmly believe um, that states with the worst human rights record don't belong on the Human Rights Council. Um, on both of these elements, um, uh, it is our view that the best way for us to reform them, to improve uh, the council as an institution, is to engage, uh, to engage with it, to engage with its members uh, in a principled fashion. And that's what we intend to do in the first instance as an observer. I know we're running out of time, so um, uh, yes, please. Um, thank you. Um, a couple of real quick questions on Latin America, shifting a bit. Um, what kind of reaction have you been getting so far from the Northern Triangle Central American countries after pulling out of the um, asylum cooperation agreements mm -hmm. on uh, Saturday, I think it was? Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, on Venezuela, all of the readouts I'm seeing, unless I missed something of, of the Secretary's calls with various world leaders, I saw Venezuela only mentioned once. Is that, why is that? Is, does that reflect a, a lack of uh, fresh ideas and strategy or why is that, why are we not seeing that come up more? No, uh, look, uh, readouts are obviously a snapshot. Um, these, these oftentimes are lengthy conversations um, and uh, readouts typically are not lengthy documents. Um, I, I, so it is, it is very fair to say that Venezuela has been a topic um, with uh, you know, many of the secretary's uh, closest, many of our um, closest uh, friends, um, allies and, and partners across the region, but um, also in, in, in Europe and elsewhere. Um, it, uh, uh, and it will continue to be the case. I think a defining hallmark um, of our strategy uh, to uh, help the people of Venezuela achieve their uh, legitimate aspirations for democracy will be uh, a coordinated uh, approach. And we talked about, um, I, I recall very distinctly with Matt, um, the uh, approach we will take with our partners um, uh, bilaterally and then in multilateral fora as well um, to ensure that we are achieving um, that outcome for uh, the people of Venezuela. When it comes to the termination of the uh, asylum cooperative agreements, uh, this was something that uh, President Biden uh, committed to when he was a candidate on the campaign trail. Um, it is a, a, a broader element of uh, the president's commitment to um, a regional migration plan 
um, uh, and a regional migration uh, strategy um, that takes into account um, the root causes of migration uh, that sees um, countries in the regions in the region, including uh, those in the Northern Triangle, uh, as as true partners. Um, as the Secretary's statement uh, over the weekend regarding the um, uh, the end of the ACA has made clear that we've notified uh, those countries. We've um, been in touch at uh, uh, different levels. This was not something uh, that came as a surprise to them. Uh, and we look forward to continuing uh, to work with uh, our partners in the Northern Triangle on a strategy to regional migration uh, that addresses many of those drivers, many of those drivers that have, um, over the course of years, uh, 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 left uh, those in the region uh, with few um, uh, perceived options rather than to migrate north. Our strategy is predicated on the idea that we can give opportunity um, uh, to those in the region um, and uh, remove some of the inducements that they might otherwise have um, to undertake the very dangerous uh, journey um, to the United States, a journey that is currently made all the more dangerous um, by uh, COVID uh, and, of course, those who would seek to take advantage of those um, uh, fleeing their their home country. So I know we've gone on for uh, quite some time. Kim, I see you earnestly raising your hand in the back, please. Thank you. Um, if Burma is the first test of the Biden administration's goal to pull together allies and produce change, um, what are your levers to produce that change in behavior? Because the Peterson Institute looked at more than two decades of sanctions against Myanmar, Burma, mm -hmm. and found it didn't produce any change at the top. The Trump administration sanctioned uh, the top coup leaders last fall. That didn't produce any change. How are you going to get them to change how they're treating the people on the ground? Well, the United States over the course of years um, has been um, the uh, most uh, ardent supporter of the people of Burma. Um, we've talked about some of that financial aid uh, in recent days. I think you heard me say the other day um, that the United States um, provides nearly $135 million in bilateral assistance to Burma. This was for FY uh, uh, 2020. Um, but beyond that, um, in FY 2020, we provided more than $469 million uh, in humanitarian assistance um, to, uh, 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 to the people of Burma bringing the U.S. total contribution since August of 2017 to nearly $1.2 billion. Um, and that figure is for all of those uh, affected by the, by, um, uh, the violence within Burma, um, as well as those who have been uh, forced to flee um, and to um, uh, flee to Bangladesh and, and throughout the region. So uh, the United States um, has been um, uh, the world's foremost um, supporter. Um, uh, we do have um, quite a bit of leverage, but as with every challenge, we have all the more leverage um, when we work closely with our allies and partners, um, including in this case with our uh, like-minded allies and partners. We've spoken to uh, one source of leverage that we are um, studying very closely right now after the designation of the, of the events of February 1st as a coup. Um, we're, very lo we're looking very closely um, at additional um, sanctions that we might be able to enact um, on uh, the on those responsible for this coup. Uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan uh, last week also spoke of the potential for um, additional executive actions. Uh, so the United States remains the most powerful country in the world. Um, there is no doubt about that. But um, when we bring our allies and partners along with us, um, they act as force multipliers. Um, we have the ability to galvanize collective action um, to confront uh, challenges the world over in a way that no other country does. Um, that's what we've been doing on Burma um, since even before the coup to uh, address the humanitarian uh, challenges of the Burmese people, including uh, the Rohingya. Um, and since February 1st, um, working very concertedly uh, with our like-minded allies and partners to ensure that we're um, working in lockstep. And so that when we do uh, announce um, uh, the additional measures um, that they will provide uh, all the more inducement to return um, Burma to its democratic civilian leadership. Thank you, everyone. I think we'll call that a day. We'll do this again tomorrow. So appreciate this.